Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody Some come back, don't they? Isn't that Everybody so? Come back, don't you tried to get into the locked drawer so? today, didn't you? you tried How to do the dead come, come back, Mother? Today, you? You What's the secret? Come. Vendetta by Ray Russell An undated letter written by Lord Henry Stanton to Sir Robert Cargrave, a London physician, probably in 1876 or 1877, judging from internal evidence. Sir Robert Cargrave, Harley Street, London, England. My dear Bobby, of all the news in your last letter, the item that has struck me most forcibly is your casual mention that telephones have begun actually to be installed in London, and that the serenity of even your own gracious home will soon be shattered by the shrilling of that vulgar novelty. In Venice, from which I write, we are still unsullied by such encroachments. The Byzantine domes of St. Mark's are visible from my terrace, and with a glass I can bring them so close as to discern the cracks in the mosaics. I can also see a strip of shimmering lagoon, crowded with gondolas, and with San Giorgio rising far in a distance. Crystalline weather, such un-English, unclouded skies, of shamelessly vivid, unabashedly Italian blue. Morning haze, warm and starry nights. To go about in a gondola by day is jolly, but to do so by night is magical. Last night I glided along the Grand Canal, past magnificent wraiths of 15th-century palazzi, gaunt, silent relics in the argent Venetian moonlight. Yes, Venetian moonlight is like no other. No sound save that of the gondolier's oar in the water, and then no light either as we turned into the Rio San Luca and lost the moon, passing under arching bridges with feeble bracket lamps that did little more than emphasize the sudden darkness of the water, sliding beneath us like black oil. I live here in my rented palazzo like a Renaissance prince, un gran signore, sipping old wine, strolling amongst the pictures and sculpture, looking out upon the city, listening to the songs of the gondoliers and poring over old books, such as a certain crumbling volume, lengthily entitled Varie avvertenze utili e necessarie agli amatori di buoni libri written some 160 years ago by the good father Gaetano Volpi, priest and librarian. The book is before me at this moment, and for your delectation, I will copy out a few passages of his advice on the care and protection of one's library. He warns us not to emulate the example of Malia Becchi, the famous librarian of Florence, who read during meals and was known to drop a kipper amid the pages to mark his place. Nor use your library to hold meetings, for it is known that bookstalls have been found convenient, or tempore or mores, for gentlemen to relieve themselves. Mark well and profit by those sage words, Bobby. And do not think that this is an ordinary palazzo in which I pass my days. It enjoys the distinction of being haunted, or perhaps I should say the reputation of being haunted, for I have yet to see or hear the shade of mad Count Carlo in these halls. I have heard his tale, however, recounted by a venerable person from whom I rent this palazzo, a remarkably well-preserved morsel of decayed gentry, eighty-five if he's a day, and possibly older, yet still fond of food and wine and blessed with that stamina which spinners of elaborate stories vitally require, to say nothing of their listeners. It was just yesterday in the latter part of the afternoon that he was here, and I asked him about the Count. He fixed me with his still bright eyes, shook his great white-haired head in the negative. Then, when I entreated him to tell, he gave a sigh, and seemed to relent, and said in his somewhat quaint and stilted way, in Italian, of course, which I here translate, So many tales are told, so much mendacious folly spread about that it is good for such a one as I to loose his tongue and say such words that may, if God is good and you incline to hear them, tell the bare, unpainted truth about these hapless folk. I nodded eagerly, offering him a chair, pouring him more wine, urging him on. He sipped the wine and waxed ruminative. A single cold misgiving yet I harbour, he said, although I will not let it stay me. It is this. My poor stiff words, ungarlanded by malice or invention, 
will yet disclose a tale more crammed with cruelty and vile device and dark profundity of horror than any silly falsehoods you have heard. Do you wish me to go on, Lord Stanton? Foolish question. Certo, I replied. You will be relieved to know I have no intention of setting down the good old man's words verbatim in their admittedly colourful but convoluted and meandering original. For few of us have time for such bedizened narratives in this modern world of telephones and talking machines. Have you heard of this latter? An American named Addison or Edison has spawned a devilish device that will abolish every opera house and concert hall in the world within a decade, I predict. A frightening and barbaric race, these Yankees. No, I will paraphrase my ancient host's tale, which I should guess took place in the vicinity of 1790, at any rate, sometime near the end of the last century. Count Carlo lived in his palazzo with a carefully chosen minimum of servants and retainers, and no other kin but his sister, Fiametta, who was as fair as he was plain. His skin was rattled, hers was opalescent, his nose was large and shapeless, hers was a dainty, demure, delicately modelled masterpiece. His eyes were small and piggish, hers large and dark and luminous and clear and shaded by the fine fringed canopies of her lashes. Many were the swains who came here to the palazzo to win her, who came, I say, but who were discouraged, turned away, repulsed, every one of them by her brother the Count. Why may not young men pay suit to me? she often asked her brother. Is it your plan to make of me a nun? At such times he would emit his dry cackle of a laugh. A nun! Ah, no, bella sorella, he would repeat the phrase in a sing-song, a kind of draft liturgy. Sorella, bella, bella sorella. You are too fair, too fine, too rare a wine, in a cloistered convent walls to pine, O oh, matchless little sister mine. Matchless is well said, since you refuse to make a match for me. And she would weep. Then he would calm her and soothe her, and assure her he was but saving her for a suitor worthy of her beauty, grace, and station, a mate of the proper blood. What is this of blood, she would wail. There are no churls who have sung songs at my window, begging for my hand, swearing eternal love, but high-born fellows all. Blood indeed. Blood, repeated the Count, and the word seemed to spur his whirling mind to spiral it into another shower of dotty dogrun, sangue rosso, sangue caldo. Again, I shall endeavour to render this into English. Blood is red, and blood is hot. Blood may seem what blood is not. Blood most innocent, if shed. Hatred on that blood is fed. Oh, brother, leave off with these riddling rhymes, I pray you. They are sour to my ear. Sour? And that would be enough to send him into another theme. That which sweetest tastes of all may be changed to bitter gall. Adonis can a monster be, and songs of love cacophony. Did you not tell me once, Bobby, that there is a form of mental disorder in which the patient expresses himself exclusively in rhyme? Count Carlo seems to be an early example. There came to the palazzo one fateful day a traveller from Spain, a handsome young man of good family who sued to see not Fiametta, but Carlo. The Count, apparently impressed by something in the young man's name or mode of approach, granted him audience. Honoured sir, said the Spaniard, you see before you one whose life is dedicated to beauty, the beauty of dappled hills, of horses, of guileless children, of gleaming ripe fruits of draperies, the sad and humbling beauty of time-worn faces, the cold beauty of silver, the warm beauty of gold, the unadorned beauty of man and woman in their perfection, all these and more I have captured upon canvas. For some time now I have dreamt of a great picture, my dear Conte, Mother Eve, alone in the garden, in the innocence before the fall, the world a glowing quietude around her, unblemished, undefiled. This picture I have sketched and sketched again more times than I can say, the composition and much of the detail, the trees and flowers, 
gossamer insects, playful tame beasts, a soft sky and gentle clouds above them, I lack but one element without which all is naught. Eve herself escapes me. Nowhere have I found her, not among living models or in the realms of my mind, and it is not for want of searching. Carlos said, You fascinate me, honoured guest. Pray go on and tell the rest. It was a friend of mine and sometime teacher, the young man continued, who put me on the scent, as it were. He is himself an artist of no small gift, recently appointed Pintor de Camara, Francisco Goya by name, and one day he said to me, Ramon, when a man has painter's ears as well as painter's eyes, he notes things other men pass by. That talk we heard in taverns a month or two ago, and again this past week, those stories, rumours about a young Venetian maiden named Fiametta, whose beauty is the theme of songs and sonnets in her own land, might there not be some truth behind them? Do you not recall the ardour, the passion of the song we heard that sailor sing? Divina Fiametta, bellissima, giovinetta. Is it likely that the subject of this song is but a fiction? Where there is smoke, is there not likewise fire? If I, like you, were searching for an eve, and if I, like you, were unencumbered and not saddled with a court appointment, I would get me straight away to Venice. So said my friend, and I am here, dear Count. Carlo, who had thwarted all others seeking interviews with Fiametta, seemed to succumb immediately to the Spaniard's blandishments. Even the thought that his sister as Eve would be obliged to pose, or naturel, did not perturb him. In his words, though men are ruled by lechery and lust, physician, priest, and painter, one may trust. One small step had yet to be taken, of course, obtaining the permission of the lady herself. We've all heard that opposites attract, but I have found this less true than the axiom that like speaks to like, that beauty speaks to beauty and grace calls out to grace. And surely this was the state of things when Fiametta for the first time beheld Don Ramon José Villardo Simana de Reña, for if she was a young goddess, he was a young god, a Grecian statue, a catalogue of perfections, reflecting her own beauty, lustre for lustre, even to the opal glow that lit both his skin and hers. They were fated to fall immediately and furiously in love, Lock and key seemed not more made to join together, and such elemental passions as theirs, not hurricane, nor holocaust, nor puny man, nor almighty God, may tear in twain. Her permission, it is superfluous to say, was granted at once. And so it was, the Fiametta was left behind closed doors with Don Ramon while he blocked out the main liniments of the huge canvas and painted the first brush strokes. Days went by, and weeks, and on every day of this time, save Sundays, Fiametta spent hours under the eyes of Ramon, as innocent of raiment as the eve she represented. Are we to be surprised, then, that one morning Carlo stepped suddenly, unexpectedly, into the room to find not only Eve, but also Adam, cleaving together, not on canvas, but in the living flesh. Behind them, like a fine theatrical cloth, stood the immense spectrum of colour that was the uncompleted canvas, the lush jungle of Eden, veiled in primordial mist, the leaves and grasses in every imaginable variety of green, the flowers a dazzling riot of vibrant scarlet, soft lavender, bright yellow, lush purple, the insects and birds almost audibly buzzing and chirping, the lion and the lamb asleep together, and coiled sinuously in the branches of the focal tree, the unblinking, watchful serpent. The figure of Eve had hardly been touched. She remained a blurred charcoal outline. But this gaping cavity in the canvas was masked by the figures of the flesh and blood model and her painter, who seemed to be part of the picture, but a part that stood out in breathtaking relief, like a masterly example of trompe l'oeil. With a cry of shock, the young lovers drew apart and reached for draperies to cover themselves with all. 
Fiametta trembled at the wrath she knew would come. Ramon, when his voice returned to him, gathered about himself as much dignity as the circumstances would permit, and said, Sir, I alone am blameworthy in this. Here is my breast. Draw your sword and slay me, for I know that you must. But find forgiveness for your sister and spare her life, I beseech you. Carlo appeared to be confused by this speech and asked for elucidation, whereupon Ramon replied, In my country, you, as the lady's brother and only living relative, would be compelled by custom to observe the pundonor, the point of honour, and slay the woman as well as the man, even though the woman be raped. Blood alone, the blood of both, can wash out such a stain. So it may be in Spain, said Carlo. Then he laughed in a not unfriendly manner and added, Your ancient ways it ill becomes me to disparage, but all the punishment I plan for you is marriage. Nothing could have pleased the two young people more than this. They joined Carlo in laughter, and then, and there, under the most, uh, shall we say, informal of conditions, made plans for a quiet wedding to take place in one week's time. It was a simple ceremony attended almost entirely by the servants, conducted in the chapel of the palazzo by a simple padre of the district. Ramon took up residence in the palazzo, the old walls of which seemed to glow with the love of the newlyweds. Their life was an enchanted idyll. They lived in an Eden of bliss that paled the painted Eden of his canvas. The picture was at length finished. It hangs here now in the main hall, where all may see and admire the beauty of Fiametta Eve and the talent of her adoring husband. Some nine months after that embarrassing interruption that precipitated the hasty marriage, Carlo planned a supper for the three of them. Fiametta was great with child. The midwife expected the infant to arrive the following day, so the supper was in the way of a celebration. The finest wines and cheeses were brought forth from the cellar, Roasted birds and baked meats were proffered. Fantastic pastries decorated the table. There was much laughing and joking, a deal of kissing, and Carlo and Ramon exchanged a great many stories of chivalry and brave exploits, thus delighting Fiametta, who liked a good tale. Carlo asked Ramon if he did not perhaps know a story concerning Pundonor, which would help him understand this strange custom of the Spaniards. I do replies Ramon, a story both true and terrible. A story close to me for reasons you'll soon perceive. It is a story of a beautiful Spanish widow, the still young mother of a boy, not yet fifteen, who was seduced, nay, raped would be the more honest word, by a hidalgo of hot blood and cold cunning, grown bold by the recent death of the poor lady's husband and protector. But, he did not reckon with her brother, who, as guardian of the family's good name, slew him, then slew the lady too, his own sister, to satisfy the code of Pundonor, which demands that both a defiler and defiled must be slain. How cruel, said Fiametta, that the lady too should die. It's a heartless code, this Pundonor. Carlo, agreeing with her in his jingling, jangling way, said that the Italian Vendetta, was much more sensible and fair than Pundonor, since it would demand the death of the traducer only, not of the wronged woman as well. Placing a tender hand upon her husband's arm, Fiametta cooed, My love, you said this tale was close to you. Or was the poor widow your mother, and yourself the lad of fifteen years? No, my sweet, I was ten at the time. But there is more to tell. The unhappy lady was my dear and saintly aunt, the brother who spilt her blood my father, my cousin, the boy fifteen, for whom I and my little sister were wont to play and gamble for hours together, so congenial we were. That dear cousin, that jolly companion, rolled by his mother's death and by the manner of it, wrought a horrible revenge upon us, Ramon shuddered. Even now, across the span of years, the picture of that vengeance poisons me. Count Carlo said, but pray go on, although it chill your marrow, a half-told tale's a bow without an arrow. Ramon resumed, One night, while we all slept, my cousin stole stealthily into our house, crept up to the bedchamber of my little sister, and then, with his father's sabre, which we found all bloody on the floor, hacked her into unrecognizable pieces. 
Fiametta sucked in her breath and recalled, Ah, oh, no! Butchered that four-year-old. Butchered her tiny, blameless form as if she were a suckling pig. Nay, one would not even chop a pig so much so madly. Oh, my poor Amon! Fiametta sought to solace him with tender kisses upon his cheek. So wrought was he with the reliving of that hideous event. And your cousin, she asked, how did he fare? Was he caught and punished? But Ramon shook his head. He vanished. We searched for weeks, for months, a year, but he was never found. A silence had covered the table like a shroud. The setting sun cast a ruddiness upon the room that, at any other time, would have been lovely, but now looked like nothing more nor less than a film of blood. At length, Carlo rose from the table, stroking his chin reflectively and paced, saying, This haunted tale of hellish hate I might yet elaborate. Elaborate, said Ramon wonderingly. That story? Carlo nodded. Suppose by devilish design indeed your cousin killed a swine, made of it a mincemeat mess, wrapped in the silk nightdress of your sister, and then fled, bearing her away. Not dead, not dead, but very much alive, to such a place where she should thrive and grow more beautiful each day in a palazzo, far away. He turned suddenly to the puzzled Spaniard. In a, in a palazzo, said Ramon. You, you mean in Italy? Carlo nodded. Strewed the gory pieces of a pig in her crib and left the sabre there? Carlo bowed. Ramon tried to smile. It's an ingenious conceit, I grant, but... His voice trailed off, uncertainly. Said Carlo, That cousin of such horrid fame, Tell me, may we know his name? Ramon opened his mouth and closed it again without replying, as if the requested name had frozen in his throat. His eyes flickered from Carlo to Fiametta and back again. She, who had been silent through this, now said, Ramon, what was your cousin's name? Ramon did not look at her. In a chilled voice he said, Carlos. Carlo laughed. Fiametta laughed too, at what she knew not. Her laughter faded and died as her mind called back a line from one of Carlos' past nonsense verses. Blood may seem what blood is not. Did it have a meaning? And blood most innocent if shed, hatred on that blood is fed. What of that? Was it mere foolery or something much worse? She turned to regard her husband. Unspeakable suspicions were beginning to distort the sweetness of his face. Or was it something in her own thoughts that was making his beauty ugly in her eyes? That which sweetest tastes of all may be changed to bitter gall. Adonis can a monster be, and songs of love, cacophony. Giggling hollowly, she plucked her husband's sleeve and said to him, This is but a mad jest. It's his peculiar way. Turning desperately to Carlo, she said, Tell him it's only a foolish verse, brother. Carlo was no longer laughing. He looked icily down upon her. Never more call me your brother, he pointed to Ramon. Use that name upon this other. No, she shouted hoarse with disbelief. Ramon, my brother, this is your silly fancy. Ramon howled, it cannot be. But he had grown pale. Now rising, staggering under the full implications of Carlo's words, he upset the table, sending chalices of wine clanging to the marble floor, their crimson contents gushing like sanguinary floods. I am here of my own volition, he cried to Carlo. You could never have seen my coming. His eyes glazed with a new thought, and he reeled away from Carlo, saying, And yet, Fiametta now spoke, her voice blanched by dawning horror, And yet did you not say that tales reached your ears of a maiden whose, whose beauty? She broke off, her voice strangled in her throat, her ivory bosom heaving with the pound of her heart. Oh God, those who spread the tales, they must have been his accursed minions. Ramon's whole frame was shaking. He took Fiametta's terror-stricken face in his hands and studied it, and looked into her eyes, and he said in a voice all groan and whimper, You do not resemble him. 
You were closer to me in likeness. To me. Carlo had wandered out onto the parapet and was now standing with his head thrown back and arms outspread, looking aloft into the blood-red sky. In a frenzied, declamatory voice, he addressed an apostrophe, presumably to the spirit of his hated uncle. Slayer of my mother, see, I avenge that infamy. See your son and daughter wed, sharing a corrupted bed. See her swollen by his seed, soon to spawn a loathly breed. Thus Ramon and Fiametta consummate my sworn vendetta. His insane laughter echoed along the canals. But I must bring this to a close, Bobby, for my eyelids grow heavy. I was kept awake last night by those confounded bells of Venice, the tolling of the enormous Campanile bell first, followed by that pair of sledgehammer men on the orologio, one of them always two minutes behind the other ever since 1497, I'm told. In that two minutes there is no silence, however, for there is another unidentifiable bell in the vicinity of St. Mark's to fill the vacuum. Promptly at six in the morning, the Campanile again shakes the town as its great bell calls the faithful to worship. And yet, I love this glorious clangor. What is mere sleep compared to such a symphony? There will be sleep and to spare for all of us when we are laid in the earth. The rest of my story you can guess, or most of it. Ramon, driven by justified rage as well as by the dictates of Pundonor, killed Carlo, or Carlos, and Fiametta. And finally, himself. This treble tragedy grows even starker when we consider the distinct possibility that Carlo's little disclosure may have been a figment made up out of whole cloth, just as Fiametta fleetingly had hoped. His mad mind may have fabricated the whole thing for the first time when he heard Ramon's account of those childhood horrors. And certain convenient facts relating to the resemblance between Ramon and Fiametta may have seemed to corroborate Carlo's story. But have you not seen two strangers more alike in looks than some siblings you've known? Have you not seen brother and sister quite unlike each other in appearance? As for the seeming prophecy of the earlier verses which so terrified Fiametta when she recalled them, did they really contain secret knowledge, or were they no more than crazy Carlo's cryptic word juggling, meaningless jingles with obligatory classical illusions? I fear we'll never know whether Carlo's mischief was a fiendish plot stretching over many years, or merely a tall tale concocted that fatal night. My venerable host offers no opinion on this matter. When he left me yesterday, he merely added that Fiametta's child did not die, as one would assume, but was born at the moment of his mother's death. You, Bobby, are a physician and will know if such a thing's possible. He further claims that this child is still alive and he hints, rather broadly, that this offspring of a possibly unnatural, possibly quite natural union, is none other than himself. I'll admit, he's old enough to be. Before I close, I must tell you that the great diva, Maria Waldman, is here in Venice, preparing what will be her last opera season. She's retiring to marry Count Galazio Mazzari, and she has promised to write me a letter of introduction to her friend Signor Verdi, whom I hope to visit soon at his home, St. Agatha. He is searching for a subject for his next opera, and I propose to recount the above story and perhaps undertake the writing of the libretto, Ramon e Fiametta, or possibly Carlo, Conte di Venezia, or better still, La Vendetta, un drama di Enrico Stanton, musica di Giuseppe Verdi. And what do you think? Please write a good long letter whenever you're not chattering on your telephone. And when you do write, please tell me if it's true what I've heard, that the Empress of Brazil has sent our dear Victoria a gown woven entirely of spider web. I prefer to believe it, but my preferences, as you know, have always been for the Baroque. Your friend, Harry. Everybody dies, don't they? Everybody so dies, don't they? Isn't that so? You tried to get into the locked drawer today, didn't you? How do the dead come back, Mother? What's the secret? Vendetta by Ray Russell. So this is episode two.
of season two of the Classic Ghost Stories podcast. We moved over to season two, as you remember, because I've moved um, most of the podcast episodes now to subscriber only. So every month on the first of the month or thereabouts, we'll have a free one that will go out to the world. But the other three in the month are just for subscribers like you. So I can just really thank you. And I will thank you again at the end because I'm so grateful. I want to thank you at least twice. Anyway, let's talk about this uh, episode. This is Vendetta by Ray Russell. Now, Ray Russell was an American writer born in 1924 in Chicago, who died in 1999 in Los Angeles, California. He's best known for his horror stories, but he also wrote science fiction and mystery. He wrote short stories in the main and novellas, but um, his first novel was The Case Against Satan, which was an early version of The Exorcist. And I actually like The Exorcist, book which came out of course in the 70s and was the famous film the, he, i haven't read russell's the case against satan which is very catholic apparently but yeah they, it's very highly rated and so it, people say he wrote the exorcist 10 years before the exorcist was written this story the, in in a number of uh, russell's stories he has the device of setting them in letters between two victorian english gentlemen the one is Lord Harry Stanton, who's a bit of a gadabout and travels the, the Europe mainly, uh, staying in castles and palazzos and things. And the other is Sir Robert Cargrave, who stays at home and he's a doctor and he's usually in London. Of course, the most famous of Russell's stories are Sardonicus, Sanguinarius and Sagittarius, and the three like a trio. And they are reworkings of uh, other stories. So you can understand Sardonicus as a version of Beauty and the Beast. And in that one, Sir Robert Cargrave does travel abroad. He goes to this castle to rescue his uh, his childhood love. It's a great story. It's, it's, it's a novella, really. It's a bit long to read. Or it would be a multi-episode one, like I did for Don't Look Now and various others that you're familiar with. Um, Sagittarius is Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde version of and sanguinarius is a story of elizabeth bathory who was a hungarian countess who who was real and who murdered a lot of people and bathed in their blood because she thought it would give her eternal life so they're great stories there's a little tiny hint of sort of bdsm or something in them but in fact you know most of his career, Ray Russell wrote for Playboy magazine at a time when Playboy used to publish original fiction, and and he and and in fact his stories were published in Playboy, so maybe it was to suit that market. I don't know. This one, I, I I've got to tell you that Ray Russell is one of my favourite authors, but I, I I love the Gothic, you know, and Russell's language and his sentence con- constructions and his settings. So gothic, you know, haunted palazzos in Venice or in Sardonicus's ruined castle, a castle in in Transylvania in uh, Sanguinarius. So he's very, very gothic. And this this story here, I loved so much about it, the language. But of course, old Carlo talks in rhyme. I mean, goodness me, he must have been smiling as he wrote that because it's amazing. And it, funnily enough, it puts you back into Elizabethan plays where they did sometimes, the speech was sometimes in rhyme. And there's something very Elizabethan about this um, mixed identities and revenge, of course, Elizabethan revenges tragedies. The And, I, you know, when you come down to the mechanics of the revenge, this 15-year-old boy appalled that his uncle had killed his mother uh, for um, the crime of being raped, you know, it's very unfair. And so you can understand why he's upset. But he kidnaps his four-year-old cousin. She doesn't remember she's not his sister. Maybe, plausible. And he comes to Italy and raises her as his sister. Okay. Then Ramon is his cousin, who he lures to to complete his revenge some 20 or so years later. So, you know, what do they say? Revenge is a dish best served cold, and it certainly is pretty cold in this. And there's a lot of forethought gone into this revenge, this vendetta. And it's so well foreshadowed, all the rhymes about blood. Even the sky is bloody, but, you know, he talks about the proper blood and uh, and Adonis may become a beast. And it's all absolutely clear at the end what he's talking about. But at the beginning, 
you don't have a clue. You just think he's going on a bit. But, um, you know, it, it is really brilliantly foreshadowed. Yeah, it's a, it's a great throwback. The other, it, it almost also, the other genre reminds me of a sort of fairy tales. But uh, bizarrely, what kept coming into my mind was, I don't know if you know The Princess Bride, particularly the movie. Um, yeah, I've got the book upstairs, but I haven't got around to reading it, and I will, before I'm too much older, read it. But uh, I don't know if you remember the Sicilian who's fiendishly clever in The Princess Bride. If you've never seen The Princess Bride, you should probably go and watch it. And he keeps, you know, going, inconceivable. And he's so smart. He's plotting these labyrinthine, convoluted plots of revenge and things like that. And so he reminded me of Carlo. It didn't make me laugh. I wasn't scared of this. Uh, I don't think it's a horror story. It's, it's, it is fairly horrible. Well, I mean, maybe it is a horror story. It's not a ghost story, but it's a horror story about a horrible fate, a treble tragedy. So Elizabethan. Anyway, that was, it was great. So I said I was going to do other things. I promised you other stories. And, and, you know, just as the week goes by, I do something else. But so I've no idea what I'm going to do next week. It's another subscribers only one. I will think of something. There's so many stories out there, so many stories that I really like. So I'll do something. I don't know if you saw on the Facebook page, I did a um, uh, Facebook Live of The Sweeper by M. Burridge, which is a really good story. The only thing is you've got to look at me. And I think, oh, my God. But, um, yeah, if you do, go to the Facebook group, Classic Ghost Stories Facebook group, and there's a me sitting there reading The Sweeper. And the sound's not bad, considering I just did it on, I've got this camera, GoPro, bought one. So, it, yeah, it's not too bad at all. So there's that. I have released in advance my new collection, Horror Stories for Halloween, which is about 100,000 words, so it's quite a big lump of a book. Um, I mean, you support me a lot anyway. So I probably actually come to think of it, will post it. Yeah, let's do that because you support me a lot anyway. So I'm going to post up the PDF and the ebook on um, Substack and Patreon. Some people came over to Substack. Some people stayed on Patreon. Look, look, let's do it, do it, do it the way you want. Either, either way is good for me. So I'll post to both. It's not a problem. Oh, yeah, I'm going to do a version of this with sound effects as well, I think, because I'm going to download. There's a... Uh, horror sound effects thing from a company, a German company called Ghost Hack, and I'm probably going to buy that and just mess around. I'm doing that because I've been listening to some fiction podcasts, particularly Lime Town and Alice Isn't Dead, and they use a lot of um, music. Now, people's opinions are divided about music in stories, so I'm going to do two versions. The one you've just heard clearly doesn't have any music underlying it. It's just me reading it. So we'll see what you think. I'd be interested to know what you think, actually, if you want to post something somewhere, either via Twitter or um, the Facebook group or, you know, Instagram, wherever the classic ghost stories is to be found. Anyway, that's me rambling again. I'll speak to you next week. Isn't that so? Isn't that so? Isn't that so?